Hello and welcome to another episode of Retro Island Diskettes. Our castaway this week has worked on what was and remains, albeit under a different name, one of the most well-known game studios in the world. He's worked on some of the most iconic titles of the 90s, the mere mention of which will give many listeners a massive attack of nostalgia. An attack is the right word, because the titles our guest was involved with certainly made waves in the industry, and they really set the bar high in terms of quality and presentation. We're pleased to welcome to the warm sands none other than the legend that is Steve Hammond from DMA Design fame. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I think you dispute the title legend. Uh, I, I I just I was a hanger on really. I just fell into it by accident and uh, didn't leave it a bit. Well, Steve, let's get the ball rolling. Why don't you introduce your first track and tell us why you chose it? You got to start with a bit of Rob Hubbard, uh, one man and his droid. The reason I chose this, um, well, there's two reasons really. Well, one, it's a great tune. I mean, can't really dispute that. More pretentiously, I think it illustrates how the how we were a genuine subculture, because you know back in the eighties. We were just doing our own thing, you know, just off in the corners with our computers. And I remember Transversion Vamps living on video. I heard that as a Commodore 64 loading track, you know, a cover, before I heard the real thing. So, One Man and His Joyed, you know, it, it was our music. Well, it was my music, certainly. And, you know, at one, one pound ninety nine, you know, one of those Mastertronic titles. I thought, buy it for the music. It had a good game, and that was just a bonus. <laughs> Hubbard's tunes, always a popular choice on the show. I always like the cover art on this game. You've got a spaceman with his droid dog herding alien sheep called Ramboids. You say you bought this game for the soundtrack, but when did you start to take an interest in the graphics and art of games? That's a good question. The, you know, because a game came to us as a complete thing. And it took a long time to, you know, for it to sink in that somebody did the graphics, somebody did the audio, somebody did the coding. We never called it coding in those days. It was just programming. Um, I think it was actually when the demos came along. Because a game, it was a game. You played the game. That's what it was for. But a demo, well, that, that was graphics. Art for its own sake. So yeah, um, it, I think it was only when we started seeing demos and games where the graphics made us go, how did they do that? Things that made us go, wow. It was during the early 80s that you became involved in the Kingsway Amateur Computer Club. Tell us a bit about what happened there and who you met. I'm really not sure how I came to hear about it. I think it would have been through a friend uh, that there was a, a computer club that anybody could come along to with a computer you know, at the, the Kingsway uh, Technical College. So one night I went along, um, brought my VIC-20 and just kept on going. I don't have any specific moment that I remember meeting people you know it was just you know a crowd a crowd and then there was a few of us kind of just conglomerated together you know I started speaking to Mike Daly at first Uh, Mike didn't come along to the club for another few years after that I think Russell and Russell Kay and David Jones were there first Uh, you know Dave was a big presence there Uh, you know one night you brought along the Spanish spectrum and you know, the, yeah, yeah, Spanish. You know, you, you can, and we thought it was almost like a comedy version of the language. You know, because he type in someone just like hit hit the key and it would go El Buggo in programmer. <laughs> you know, that, that's the sort of thing you get on comedy telly, isn't it? So that was a that was a Spanish spectrum, and yeah, as much as I want to say otherwise, yeah, it was a hotbed of copying, <laughs> copying games. It, it really was. But, you know, sorry, backing up games. What was amazing to me is that, you know, when I went along there, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, real people were making 
games instead of you know them appearing out of nowhere. Well, you know, Dave and Russell, they were actually working on games. So whilst everyone else was, you know, talking about basically whose computer is better, me and Mike and Dave and Russell, you were talking about, well, you know, making games, oh, that's kind of fun, isn't it? Oh, that's cool. When did the process of making games together rather than individually in your bedrooms come about? Was it an organic process, this group forming? Yeah, it was organic. When it, when it came to the, the, the Kingsway Computer Club, we, we we seem to pair off in different ways, you know, Mike and Dave would do something, Russell and Dave would do something, me and Mike would do something. And, you know, any ambitions I had to be, in, you know, a coder at that point, well, yeah, I hadn't really thought of it. Mike was just so much more advanced. You know, he, he twigged Assembler, you know, way before, you know, I, I even figured out what those numbers meant. So, well, if he's doing programming, I can do graphics. It was it was almost an off the cuff thing. Well, you know, I, I can do graphics. I, I I didn't see why I couldn't do graphics. So on um, it was a plus four. Uh, Mike wrote a breakout style game called Freakout, and I did the graphics for that. Monochrome graphics, you know, character based. And the best part of this was uh, uh, at that time I had uh, a four inch black and white TV, so it was portable. So I would take it along to Mike's, and you know he would do coding. I would sit there on this tiny screen using Tony Crowther's 3-in-1 to draw these blocks. You know, it, it, it was very basic, but it was enjoyable. And you would do that. Mike would set the game, uh, not, not compiling, the um, assembling. And, you know, and then we'd head off and get chips and then come back and, you know, it had almost finished. That sort of thing. I mean, that, that, was, that was proper bedroom coding or bedroom game design. I say design. <laughs> it, just, I it, it all just congealed, really. Would you like to introduce your next tune? Okay, uh, my next tune is the uh, the title music from Parallax. And I didn't actually like it at first, because, well, it's a game, Parallax. Parallax layers of scrolling. Yeah, very cool. Why it caught its name? So, you know, the music, I didn't really take any notice. It's like, mm, that's, a, that's a bit funny. Into the game, start playing it, and, you know, oh, that's a nice in-game tune. And then somebody said, you know, listen to it, listen to the whole thing. I said, okay, listen to the whole thing. And it is the longest intro of any bit of music that I can imagine. You know, and it, I, it was almost like it was making you work for enjoying it. And then after about seven or eight minutes, it just breaks through into this melody. And I was like, oh, wow. It, it's, it's, you know, and, and it became a very symbolic thing. It's just, oh, this is breaking free into something, you know, a lovely melody, and then, of course, the ending just crashes out in a kind of electronic noise, and I thought, yeah, that's a metaphor for life, isn't it? <laughs> you know? I, I, I don't know. I think I had a, a quite funny upbringing. You know, you know I just, I, I wanted to escape. That was the, that was the thing. That would have been, what, 84, 85? The, the, the mid-80s? Yeah, because... Uh, I mean, at that time, you know, I was reading 2000 AD and a character who has since cast a long shadow over, you know, my life is uh, Halo Jones in The Ballad of Halo Jones. As, uh, in, in the comic, you know, she was just, just a normal 18-year-old woman who wanted to, quote, escape from the confines of her life. And I thought, yeah, me too.
I understand you also had ambitions to be an artist for the comic 2000 AD. Did you ever pursue that dream? Well, no. Um, at, at that time, you know, this was, uh, you know, coming up to the end of sixth year and, you know, we had to fill out our ACAS forms, you know, what you want to do, uh, you know, you for uh, for university. And honestly, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea. Um, being an artist was something that just might happen anyway. And I never thought of it as a career as such. Just part of reading 2000 AD means that you want to draw the characters. And, you know, I I I was reasonably okay at drawing the vehicles. You know, pen and ink, you know, had the, the rope ring, isograph pen. Uh, top of my year for technical uh, technical drawing. So I talked to my careers advisor and you know, I did not know how to express what I wanted to be, which I have subsequently figured out would be graphic design. So, but that's a path that I never, I never ended up taking. So all, all my uh, uni forms ended up being computing related. In terms of your art side, I mean, so it sounds like you had this, as you say, this passion that you didn't know how to express. It's, it sounds, is it, is it true to say then that you weren't inspired by, you know, traditional artists? I, I didn't know who traditional artists were, really. I was growing up with uh, comic artists like, you know, Brian Bolland, Ian Gibson, Steve Dillon, and they were telling stories, you know, not making posters, they were telling stories, you know, it was dynamic and, and, and it was kind of discouraging really because when you, you're trying to, oh, I want to do art and you're measuring yourself against the best people in the world, you're going to fall short. So, you know, I, I go easily discouraged, um, you know, I'm sorry to say, and, you know, I think I gave up a bit too quickly. As a child, if you're told, you know, yep, you're very bright, you're intelligent, you're clever, all that sort of thing, you don't end up putting in the effort. So I, I kind of thought, well, yeah, if I don't understand something immediately or I wasn't good at something immediately, I gave it up. And really what was missing was putting in the graft. <laughs> I've just been shown the 2000 AD annual from 1978 to 1985 to... I've got them all sitting across there. I've got my f a f a special one here, by the way. This is the yeah year I was born. So ah, so. oh, cool. Steve, you said that you were discouraged when you compared yourself to say the two thousand AD artists, but when you shifted to computer art, did you not feel that same discouragement? Did you feel that you were on a par with your contemporaries? Well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because eight bit graphics are easier to do than sixteen bit graphics. So to begin with, uh, what I was doing, I, I think it was as good as anyone else's, uh, you know, give or take. But then as time progressed, people, you know, individuals would do a complete game. But now we were getting into specialization. So new generation machines, you know, the Amiga and, yeah, of course, the Amiga is an artist's machine, really. So we get specializations. A game now has a coder, an artist, uh, a musician. You know, and then the actual publishing, you know, instead of, you know, scribbling, you know, a cassette inlay, somebody would do the graphic design for the CD or the cassette or, or whatever it was and take care of the distribution. So, yeah, it, it was a, becoming a bigger industry and I I didn't keep up. I, I definitely did not keep up with that. I, I think I kind of let myself go in a way because, uh, you know, as I say, I didn't put in that effort. You know, I got discouraged and, well, you know, I can I can take it so far, and you know I was starting to have other interests as well. You know, as, you know specifically the writing. So you know I'd been writing daft wee things since I was thirteen, and you know that I seemed to be a hobby. I didn't quite see how it could fit into games, at least you know not at this point. But graphics, you know, that was, you know, I could do that. I could do that. What did the Amiga offer you as an artist that you didn't previously have the capability to perform for before? And what tools did you use? Well, previously it was 3-in-1 on the Commodore 64, you know, to put in graphics. They were all character-based, you know, so, you know, one character would be the corner of a box, another character would be, you know, a top right-hand corner. And, you know, when memory got tight, you know, one graphic, or, sorry, one character with a bit of tweaking could do double duty for two different graphics. But the Amiga, it offered bitmap graphics, uh, many more colours as well. And I think most importantly it offered a mouse. 
and and this is where I started to falter because then the people with you know real art, artistic talent could express themselves in that medium, whereas I I struggled. Do you remember these eight bit light pens that you used to be able to get, Steve? I have one. Okay, and were they a gimmick, or could you actually use them as an artist's tool? It was terrible. It was really, really bad. <laughs> um, not least, you know, accuracy aside, I mean, I'm sure there were good ones you could calibrate them, but accuracy aside is holding up this pen to the screen all the time and your arm started to hurt within minutes. Uh, I mean, it even got its own term, gorilla arm. <laughs> you know, it's off, you know, using that pen, I'll get gorilla arm too soon. Why don't you tell us um, about your next track, Steve, and we'll carry on the conversation. Okay, uh, my next track is the Sanction Loading Music. Uh, Again, a Rob Hubbard one. And I don't know what it was about that, but that was the first bit of music that I I became evangelical about. And and this, again, is with me completely managing to miss the entirety of the 80s, you know, mainstream culture when it came to music. You know, even though it was, okay, maybe a wee subculture, maybe a wee niche thing about these bits of, you know, what we now call tip tunes... It started to feel real when on a cover of Zap 64, they gave away a cassette and Rob Hubbard did remixed it using, you know, quote, real audio equipment. That's the thing. And, you know, and here was this, you know, very Jean-Michel Jarre inspired uh, bit of music, you know, on a school trip, you know, I, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, you know, I, I played it on the last day of school in the common room. People I would never see again. Some of that was good. <laughs> Some not so good. But really, it was a kind of, I, I don't know, you know, you know, marking something, you know, making a mark, just, you know, this is my bit of music. Chip tunes and, and on all this side of the culture is so unique, is that I remember at least once Rob Hubbard topped the chart, or topped a poll, as best programmer. So, and it's this mix of programming and music, and, you know, when we come to the demo scene, you know, music and art that, you know, makes it something new and unique. So you went out with a bang, playing this in the common room like a legend. <laughs> like an idiot. And then you had to go <laughs> And then you had to go out into the big world of work. And it was with your old Kingsway Computer Club friends that uh, you found yourself at DMA Design. Had DMA already formed by then or were you there when it was still an idea? No, DMA uh, began in nineteen eighty eight. But it wasn't with DMA to begin with. Uh, I joined, I think it was 1991 as well, because I was at college during that time. I mean, Dave was also there. He was on a different course to me. Uh, so, you know, we, we never really saw each other uh, at the college, but we did see each other at, there was a, another computer club. You know, it was like, you know, a, a remake of the original computer club instead of 8-bit machines, 16-bit machines, Amigas, Ataris, and... You know, by that time, Dave had started writing Menace. In fact, he'd started writing Menace, I think, you know, when he was at the back of the lecture, you know, just forget that, you know, writing down bits of code. He knew where his destiny was going. You know, he, he had no doubts about that. It was in the in the club room, which the name DMA actually came about. I'm not quite certain if Dave had, you know, thought, yeah, it'll be called DMA's design before he turned up. But he got everyone around the table, you know, he, he, no, he, Dave was good at getting everybody around the table to discuss things, you know, just getting people together. Names for the company. 
So I suggested Milliard because I'd read it in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, Russell suggested Visual Voyage, which I, I really quite liked. And, you know, there's other suggestions. And Dave, yeah, DMA, because it's a register in the computer, you know, direct memory access. Oh, does it, what does it stand for? Um, oh, uh, direct mind access. So originally, DMA stood for direct mind access. And that fact was never mentioned again <laughs> the rest of my time at DMA. <laughs> so I think he, he came up with that and then forgot it the next day. So, you know, that's the original name for DMA. So by the time you found yourself at DMA, was it a professional setup? You know, was it a well laid out working environment and conducive to making hit games? It, <laughs> it had the spirit of the bedroom coder for quite a long time. I mean, during my time at college, you know, I uh, was doing graphic conversions for Dave. Uh, this was uh, Psygnosis, Ballistics, and then Shadow of the Beast, you know, taking these lovely Atari and Amiga graphics and cramming them into four colours and a character set you know, for the Commodore 64. But it was paid work. Um, you know, it was still freelance. Uh, and, and one day, Dave, when I came into the office, just said, Steve, do you fancy a job? And I went, yeah, sure. You know, that is the easiest job interview I will ever have. It was still a bunch of mates having a laugh. Yeah, sure, there was all the, you know, the serious stuff uh, to be dealt with. But yeah, we were having a great time. We're making games. We're making games. We're getting paid to make games. Oh, it, was, it was amazing. But at the same time, it's like, well, why wouldn't we? You know, it's... I think it seems more amazing looking back than it did at the time. At the time, were you all, you know, still kind of living with parents or did you actually have real life pressures, financial pressures? Yeah, um, I was living at home for about maybe the first year of that and then I moved into a bed sit. Mike was uh, living at home. I'm not sure about the others. Because I could imagine that that sort of affects the dynamic a lot as well. You know, people become more serious or... Yeah, I, I don't think we were ever serious. No. Uh, I mean, h- how could you be serious? You know, let's all go down to Dave's and uh, Dave's bedroom, <laughs> the Amiga, the eight foot long stereo system. And the only place to sit was this massive waterbed. So, <laughs> so, you know, me, Dave and Mike and Ross, you know, just sitting there and we're all bouncing up and down. We're going, oh, boy, boy. <laughs> serious? No. No, we weren't serious. Actually, Dave uh, got me down there uh, just to have a have a go on the Amiga, you know, because I didn't have one of, my, uh, one of my own at that time, just to try out D-Paint and do graphics. So, you know, I did some, you know, some, some graphics, you know, just, just to see how it all worked. So he played me uh, a version of uh, Menace, which uh, was called Coppercon 1 at that time. Coppercon 1, another register out of the Amiga hardware reference manual, because, you know, you like those technical names. Now, prior to that, I had, you know, well, me and Mike, you know, both of us, you know, went to Dave to the arcade in Reform Street in Dundee. And Dave basically based Menace on Salamander, you know, the arcade game. To the point that it's like, you know, he held the microphone up to Salamander arcade cabinet, Dave played the game, and I looked out for anyone who was wondering what we were doing. <laughs> so, you know, we got some sound effects that way. Uh, the soundtrack uh, at one point was uh, the firm, the Star Trekking. So, so he played. So he played me, you know, the the version of the game at the moment. So yeah, we come in peace, shoot to kill, shoot to kill, shoot to kill, repeated <laughs> over and over and over, and the sound effect for firing bang was Dave saying bang. <laughs> so aside from a bit of art and holding up microphones to arcade machines, did you have other roles at DMA? Um, to begin with, it was graphic conversions, you know, almost exclusively. It's it was. You know, I, I seem to, well, I seem to enjoy doing the, the sort of jobs that no one else really had time for or the inclination for. You know, coding, that's the cool bit. You know, you know creating art, that's cool bit. But converting art, you know, that's not so cool, but you know, I can do that. You know, it's, it's, it's an obsolete skill, certainly, but, you know, I'm glad it was there. It was Shadow of the Beast, you know, the conversion to the, from Amiga to Commodore 64. Uh, that took a long, long time. Um, you know, what was the guy's name? It was Richard Swinford was doing the conversion for on the, the programming side. He showed me the first level, and yeah, yeah that's, that's been cool. And then going on to the next level, and there was this massive gap between levels, you know, with a blank screen. So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and you know, looking at each other, and I'm 
thinking, mm hmm. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll write something for it. You know, a couple of lines, you know, you are entering the deepest, darkest dungeon, blah, blah, you know, that kind of thing. You know, just something to tide them over. And that's when I started writing for games. You know, it kind of unofficial, you know, nobody sanctioned that, but it got accepted. So, you know, I ended up doing writing. You know, I had ambitions to be a writer, you know, by then, you know, I wasn't going to be an artist, you know, what with all these developments. Um, you know, press releases, uh, you know, sheets detailing you know, all the wonderful things that we're doing. So, you know, I, I just, again, I kind of fell into that, you know, doing doing bits of writing, doing bits of art. So Menace was the first game, is that right, to come out of DMA Design? And that was published through Psygnosis. Do you know why DMA chose to partner with them for the release? Well, legend has it, really, that Dave wanted as short a drive as possible. And Psygnosis were the closest. Okay, it's that simple. <laughs> that simple. You know, whether that's true, I, I mean, I've not asked him myself. You know, this is something that's come up you know, subsequently. I, I didn't know that at the time. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought you met them at a trade show and you know, did some sort of deal. And maybe the legends built up after that, but I, I couldn't say for certain. But I certainly like that thought. Around Menace time, or just slightly after that, uh, I was freelance. It was Gary Timmons, Mike Daly. Mike was well. Mike and Gary were the first two employees. By the time we reached just past Lemmings, I was actually employee number twelve. So even though I'd been there since the beginning and I'd been hanging around since the beginning and doing stuff since the beginning, I wasn't a full time employee until you know a wee bit afterwards. Would you like to introduce your next tune? Okay, for uh, for my next track, I can't go without uh, introducing a DMA design one and it happened to be the first one, uh, Menace. It felt real because we'd heard David Whittaker soundtracks before on other games and now there was a, a similar sounding soundtrack but different for us, for our game. And that made it, that, that made it real. So Menace was released, and how well was the game received by critics? And did you take much notice of the feedback, Steve, good or bad? Well, it was released to reasonable reviews. Um, it was... I think the consensus was that it was workmanlike, enjoyable enough, but, you know, it wasn't really innovative, because, I mean, it was, after all, almost a straight copy of Salamander. I don't think I took too much notice... There, there, there was a moment uh, Dave opened a magazine. I think this was a preview, and it was still called Coppercon One. And you know the, the headline across two pages, and he'd opened it just a fraction, enough for the letters crap to appear. And he's like, "Oh no, that's a bad review. That's a bit harsh." But no, that was fine. So, I mean, it was anticipated, you know, previews. But by that time, uh, I mean, I, I was I was busy with the, you know the conversions. And I hadn't really had much to do with the game itself. I think the remaining things were uh, the names of the levels. Uh, you know, I named a few of them. You know, it was a <laughs> Dave phoned me up pretending to be US Gold once, and he took me in properly. Oh, so there's Dave here. Yeah, sorry, sorry. And then the reason for the call, um, right, you know, names for levels. So, you know, I was thinking you know, off the top of my head, you know, various science fiction things. Uh, Kruger, not after Freddy Kruger, after the, the star Kruger. Things like that, you know. So, you know, um, tiny wee bits there, but yeah, but they were there. Menace was followed by a port of Ballistics, which was a game by the developers Reflections Limited. And, uh, I think you had amazing art. I remember that as a child, seeing that on a magazine. You had that very heavy metal Iron Maiden style character. Um, were you were you involved with this game? Not the original, but the Commodore sixty four port. Yes. Again, uh, this was a graphic conversion task. <laughs> the in game graphics were by far the 
the simplest part of doing it. You know, the, the, the backgrounds. There was, uh, you know, the, this gnarled arm, you know, came out from the side of the screen, dropped the ball, and then the game started. So, you know, that was reasonably straightforward to convert, you know, a few sprites. <laughs> but by far the most effort went into that loading screen. You know, that, that really? big demonic, stony demon with a broken horn. And, yeah, you know how they say jobs are getting taken away by technology? Well, my conversion process for that screen was, uh, well, we got it printed out, you know, a massive, massive thing. It was a, a plotter, I think Dave had. So, you know, a bit, you know, a metre by another metre, this big picture. So I took a photo of that, went to Boots, got it developed, drew a grid on it, and then started doing pixel, pixel, pixel here, pixel there, pixel there. And then Russell wrote a programme to convert it automatically. <laughs> and since Mike was with Russell at the time he converted it, Mike just went, oh yeah, I'll just touch it up here, there and there, and that was that done. So, <laughs> Well, given the choice, did you have a preference on working with those ports, or did you prefer to work on original projects? Original projects, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's certainly a satisfaction in doing those kind of conversions. Uh, no one else does, or, or at least, you know, no one I can think of would do. Uh, you know, that, that went to, uh, you know, for the Atari Lynx Lemmings, the uh, the three-colour CGA graphics for the PC version of Lemmings, you know, all those sort of things. I mean, I, I guess that was kind of my specialty. So, satisfaction doing something that no one else is going to be doing, but, you know, making your own stuff, that's that's nice, isn't it? And at that time, you know, the DMA, it was a very relaxed place, you know, just... There was a tabletop role-playing game, Cyberpunk 2020, which myself and friends, you know, not DMA friends, but, you know, myself and others, you know, played in our spare time, you know, role-playing was a, a hobby. And one of the things within the game, you know, this, this near-future, dark, Blade Runner-style future were, were screen sheets, which were short newspapers, you know, I think within the game, short newspapers, you know, uh, highly, <laughs> highly strong, basically, you know, very shrill, very tense. So I thought, hey, this would be a good idea for our own adventures if I wrote them up in the form of one of these sheets. So I scanned in a picture from 2000 AD, you know, just, yeah, I don't this, and wrote, wrote some text and, you know, made it up to look like a newsletter. And, you know, Scott saw that and he liked it. And he said, so, you know, make my game, Hired Guns, would you like to write the story for it? So I thought, well, it's only fair. I'll wander along to Dave's office and opt, you know, went in, told him that, yeah, Scott's asked me to do the story. Yeah, I've said yes. And and Dave, Dave's entire response was, huh. <laughs> I think that was, I think that was yes. Hired Guns is certainly something that we want to talk about in detail with you. But we can't get to that stage without mentioning one other game. You just mentioned Lemmings 2, and I've got the box here. And on the back of it, it says, the sensational sequel to the most talked about game in the entire history of the world. <laughs> it's not far from the truth. Can you describe to us your experience of the impact of such a successful release as Lemmings? Lemmings? Well, the, the first Lemmings, uh, yeah. I, w I was still freelance, even doing Lemmings. Oh, to begin with anyway. So, uh, one of the things I also ended up doing was level design. Yeah, I mean, everybody pitched in. You know, Mike did levels, Dave did levels, Russell did levels. I did some level design. And none of my levels made it in. That said, <laughs> that said, it's still really close to my heart because Dave had one or got one of those early video cameras that could digitise pictures. So we had the graphic of a lemming digitised us as well. So I am in the game. I am in the game. <laughs> and I'm glad to say that I had more success with Lemmings too because some of my levels did make it in. Well, I, I think there's an opportunity here for you to sort of have a rustle through your um, boxes some get some of those dusty floppies and uh, you know release lemmings the lost levels the lost levels you know i i wouldn't hold out much hope but it's always possible <laughs> we had an irritating habit of reusing floppy disks you know so there, there would be disks and oh look at this it's the original source code and no it's uh, some pd software that got copied and, uh, <laughs> oh, label them please you know uh, as successful as Lemmings was, after Lemmings 2, Christmas Lemmings, Oh No More Lemmings, and all the other sequels, I did start to get a bit sick of Lemmings. <laughs> was, were you all lemminged out? Um, 
Me, no. Uh, I was well into doing hired guns uh, by that point, but everyone else seemed to be quite quite fed up with them. Uh, Lemmings 3, really, you could describe it as a contractual obligation game. You know, we had a certain number of games to do for Psygnosis, and that was the last of them. You know, relationships with Psygnosis, they, they weren't... They went great towards the end. Uh, they were late. No, you know, late in payments. You know, I'm, I'm told. And uh, well, if I recall, uh, you mentioned in a, an interview that there was uh, a TV show wanted to use Lemmings to make a sort of Sesame Street type Lemmings, and they'd uh, placed some sort of suggested changes to that. Could you, can you remember any of those changes? I think it was the Children's Television Workshop wanted uh, a version. There was also a Scottish company, Extra Vegetables, that were wanting to do... Uh, well, they were wanting to do a cartoon series based on it. Uh, the Children's Television Workshop wanted a cartoon series and a game to go along with it, but without all the violent parts. You know, no exploding lemmings, and that's kind of the, you know, the, the main thing. <laughs> now, I know we talked about it at the time. You know, uh, myself and Gary Timmons made up uh, you know, a small document with ideas for the cartoon series, which I don't have anymore. I'm ah, so gutted about that. But what I do have is the newsletters that I wrote. And there are maybe two paragraphs that refer to to this deal to do a Lemmings cartoon. It fell through. I mean, you know, a few things are certain in the, in the TV world. The, the genius of Lemmings is that, okay, you play it as a game, but it's a toy First and foremost, you can just mess about with it. You can try and complete the level, or you can just make lemmings do daft things. You know, you, you play with it. It's a toy. It's a game. It's, it's all of those things, and that's why it's such a success. You know, looking back, I, I have seen that philosophy, you know, in so much of the other DMA stuff. Steve, we're going to step back now from work and just find out a bit more about your hobbies and your involvement with computers away from DMA design and the other work you were doing. So before we do that, can you introduce your next track, please? Okay, uh, my next track is Format's Madness from Format. This was this was the culture or the subculture again. Uh, you know, before the internet, the only way to get new programs, apps, demos, mega demos, mega demos, you know, that was to really send off a stamped address envelope to an address from a place you saw in the back of a magazine. A few weeks later, a couple of floppy disks would come through. And music, you know, discs, just full of music. You know, Amiga composed music. Um, you know, we, we had moved on from uh, the chip tunes from the, you know, with the SID chip and on to the you know, sampled music from the Amiga using uh, mod trackers. This is the sort of stuff I'm into, and format stood out. Despite working in the industry, were you still able to enjoy computing and gaming as a hobby? I think um, for hobbies, you know, time outside the industry, <laughs> time to myself, it, it did blur quite a bit, I have to say. Um, I mean, but for, you know, a, a quirk of getting a VIC-20 when I was 13, I might have got a telescope instead. You know, I was uh, an amateur astronomer, and I still am. To a degree, you know, I just love looking at the stars and, you know, the mythology behind them and, 
you know how <laughs> how supernova is working all, all this sort of all this sort of thing hobbies well you know at that time early 90s mid 90s that was really when i discovered drinking <laughs> which seems terrible but you know friends you're know, going out to going out to the pub and you know pound a pint you know most days of the week i did take my work home with me you know a lot you know possibly too much because oh you know at, at the time i will say i had what is charitably described as an artistic temperament but yeah so you know doing, doing writing in an office you know particularly an open plan office oh, so many distractions so many irritations so i i ended up writing basically everything at home but yeah um you know i, I then harbored you know ambitions you know hobby ambitions of, you know, making movies. I'll tell you, though, having a diverse interest in all these creative things means that you get annoyed when you see them because either that's rubbish, wow, that's so good, I can never aspire to that, and so forth. It's taken me so long to uh, to be able to watch a movie now without trying to dissect it into its component parts, you know, and just just enjoy it. The track that you chose was by Format, and he also worked on commercial projects like making the soundtrack for Chuck Rock. And another name in the scene was Dan from Anarchy, who also worked at Core Design. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, we learned this in episode six of our podcast when we spoke to Judge Drock of Anarchy. And Dan from Anarchy put his name on the crack tro to the cracked version of Lemmings, and it was well known that he was an employee at Core Design. What were your thoughts on this and also the wider problem of piracy of products you worked on? Bearing in mind you mentioned earlier that you exchanged discs at the computer club. <laughs> yeah, um, well, tapes at the computer club. No, I, I didn't know that uh, you know he'd done that. I I assume somebody had. You know, there was a feeling in the office that you know any anti-piracy measure was temporary at best. You know, if you lasted 24 hours, you were doing quite well. So, I mean, I don't have a moral leg to stand on, really. I mean, I'll say that when we copied tapes, you know, out in the playground and all that, it was really kind of collecting them. It wasn't playing them. And it didn't stop us buying, you know, the big titles. You know, I bought Delta, I bought, you know, I, I bought quite a few things. But the ones that got copied just didn't get played. You know, it, it was as simple as that. I, if we could backtrack just slightly, I don't remember in the day them being called crack throws. It was demos and intros. Mm. Although, you know, maybe that was a different thing as well. I mean, there, there were certainly subdivisions, demos, intros, crack throws, mega demos, all, 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 all that sort of, sort of thing. Uh, Dave was a member of the Kent team and he used the alias Alien. You, you, if you look on YouTube, you can actually find, you know, uh, you know, video of, of these demos and, and some of Dave's ones, you know, wh whether he knew they were being put to, you know, crack games, I don't know, I can't say. It was probably inevitable. But you really win anybody unless you, you've written a demo or an intro or, you know, you know some minor thing, you know, to, to prove your, to prove that you went a lamer, you know, a lamer was the, the worst of the worst. <laughs> but yeah, by the time of, by the time of the Amiga, you know, I, I, I did learn some 68,000 and, you know, one night Mike was across and, you know, I showed him, you know, I, I've written a, a school in Starfield and, you know, some bouncing bars, bouncing colour bars. You have to do bouncing colour bars at some point in your life, okay? You know, it's, it's a rite of passage. Same with the Starfield, so I did a Starfield. And then, oh, we're getting ambitious, we're getting ambitious. Uh, okay, I'll do, I'll do, you know, the... Uh, you know, the sine wave text in the bottom half of the screen. And I could not for the life of me figure out how to do that. Now, Mike knew how to do the text. So, you know, he sat there, you know, doing text, coding away, just off the top of his head. You know, this, this is incredible stuff. You know, text, sine wave, nice character graphics, you know, scrolling across the screen, great. But not in the bottom half of the screen because the Amiga came in the NTSC, the American version, and the PAL UK version. We had the... The manuals there, you know, the hardware manuals, okay, how do you do this? There was nothing, you know, we just couldn't find anything. How do you make the stuff appear in the bottom of a UK Amiga? Mike had Dave's source code for Menace. Had a look through it and went, ah, there's the trick. And it was some clever timing thing with the copper chip that you just, at that right moment, you swapped out something, did something, and then you could write 
to the extended bit of the screen, you know, full screen demo. So yeah, did that. Mike calls the the demo half mine. I I, I think that's generous on his on his part. <laughs> so yeah, you know, so that was complete. You know, that was in my intro. I called myself. It was either ring pool or life form. I changed from one to the other. Mike was indie, and we were a member of a demo team called the Tartan Army, who consisted of me and Mike. <laughs> so that was it. We're not very well known, but hey. Yeah, you know. I, I never saw the Tartan Army in the Crusaders top 10 demo groups. <laughs> I won't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, no, you've seen about the wider implications of um, of piracy. Um, it did hit home one day, and this was with hired guns. Like, you know, occasionally um, we'd go across to, you know, a car boot sale and, you know, you know occasionally I would get some, in later years, you know, get some old computers, you know, a ZX81 clone, you know, well, you know, before they became expensive and popular and all that sort of thing. And there was a guy selling copied floppies. And so, I, you know, I went across and I looked through them, he just had guns, you know, that's it. That was two years of my life, you know, you're selling it for two quid. I'm not going to see any of that. And I thought of all the things I was going to say to him, and I just walked away, you know, I couldn't do anything else. And, and similarly, they, on uh, Aminet once, there was a complete copy of the manual I wrote and all the background, all the story, you know, without any of the graphics, which is possibly a good thing, but... You know, all the text I'd written, and it was thanks to, at the start of it, you know, and a, and a bunch of cracking buddies, but no mention of anybody who'd worked on the game itself. There was a cultural divide, you know, uh, really, us, them. You know, we, we thought we were the, you know, the good guys, you know, doing all this stuff, you know, the non-mainstream. But we were almost the establishment, you know, the guys making games for money, you know. Yeah. So, you know, to me, it's, it's it was a kind of respect thing. It's like, you know... We were actually doing this because we love doing it. The money was secondary. You know, I'm not going to sniff at money, but but you know we wanted to make good games. You know that was the motivator. Could you please introduce your next tune? Okay, my my next tune is uh, the Hired Guns Victory Theme, which is interesting because none of them ever had titles. It was informally called the Victory Theme, uh, and a few years back I was sufficiently pretentious enough that I went back and gave them all titles. So, I don't. Hired Guns accounts for two years of your life, as you mentioned just then, and it was critically acclaimed on release. For those who haven't played it, can you just describe the game for us? Well, basically, Hired Guns is a dungeon crawler. Before that term was invented, there was a game, Dungeon Master, uh, before that, and several... I think there's quite a few games of that ilk, and they were all fantasy-based. You know, a copy, a bit different, but all the same. And Hired Guns was science fiction, which was actually quite unusual you know, for that for that style of game. The other games had, you know, a single screen, you know, controlled by the player. Hired Guns was innovative in it. It had four screens and four characters out of a set of 12, which the player could control all at once. And the advantage of that was that Scott could then set up puzzles, which required four characters to solve. So you could do puzzles in hired guns that you could not do in those other games. I've I've not played it. Um, the closest the closest um, I can think that I would have played a game like that back in the day was a game called Exor, and you had to move around the map and you'd get stuck, and then you'd have to flip over to the other character to go get the key. But but it also sounds hired guns also sounds to me a lot 
like games that came later, like Space Hulk. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, Space Hulk. Yeah, there's a progression of technology, and Hired Guns came, I think, maybe in the middle of that. So you're credited on this title as the designer alongside Scott Johnson. Were your main responsibilities writing, or did you get to do other parts? I saw the... Uh, Reread the Wikipedia article just in case anything interesting turns up on that. And well, you know, I'm credited as a designer. I wasn't. Um, I contributed ideas certainly, but that wasn't unusual, you know, for the team. As for the story, uh, that changed uh, along the route. Not a lot of it was written with the game itself in mind. You know, I, I will admit, you know, what I wrote it was way overkill than what was really needed. Uh, at that time, you know, Babylon 5 was on telly. Uh, I was loving this, this long-form story. You know, the original story being that uh, these mercenaries have been uh, lured into a, proving, a weapons proving ground with the false pretense that they're about to do a hostage rescue. Really, it's just how will these new weapon systems fare against real targets? You know, that was the story. In the end, you know, I like to say memory limitations and the the plot within the game itself became find the nukes, blow something up, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a climb down. It highlights a, a kind of transitional period, whereas nowadays, you know, you, you, you put the game, you put the game in the CD slot, no, you download the game. It's all online now, sure. old man. The game will teach you how to play it. You will learn the story through the gameplay, you know, through the cutscenes and through all of that. But in this transitional time between a kind of story and no story and the game being the story, I wrote a short story which was in the manual, which ended with it leading into the start of the game. So that's how we did story in those days. Or at least how I did story in those days. You know, it's something that I kind of want to finish at some point because really it's half a story. It's the beginning and the game is the last part. Yeah. <laughs> and I, um, I heard... You can correct me if I'm misinformed that um, a great author who's no longer with us, Ian M. Banks, may have been some of your inspiration. He certainly was. At that time, I would go down to the, the local library and check out basically all the books on the science fiction shelf. Uh, you know, Bob Shaw and uh, Gregory Benford and, you know, all these characters. And, you know, a uh, new one, Ian Banks, and this was considered... Flebas, Flebus, I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, so that book, you know, the first in the in the culture series. So I have started to write Harrigans at this point, and you know, so I read I read this book, and the book was about mercenaries, and it, you know, and Harrigans, it's mm, 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 I don't know what the characters are yet. So I, I read this and I read this, uh, and at the end of it, I thought, yeah, the Harrigans character should be mercenaries. It was called three D game, you know, it wasn't Harrigans until you know sometime later. I found, I, I was very much into flying saucers and UFOs at that time, you know, not, not quite believing, but not really disbelieving it either. So, you know, what's out there? Is it scary? Is it friendly? And that sort of thing. And I found a book called First Contact. And this was, you know, because there's some dreadful nonsense about UFOs, really. First Contact was in the, <laughs> the supernatural section, but it was a scientific book. And this was a breath of fresh air. So it was going through all these possible ways that life could arise, intelligence could arise, how you could travel between the stars, all that sort of thing. And the, the big question, Fermi's paradox, is, well, if life is common in the universe, we should see it. We don't. Why? Okay? So th this was unlike a lot of science fiction. I decided that the higher guns universe, it was going to be humans and that's it. There's nothing out there. You know, this big empty... You know, uh, Lovecraftian void, you know, so, which is, you know, a bit, bit scary in itself. Coupled with the other idea of von Neumann probes, self-replicating machines, which is possible. What if a civilization out there just set replicating machines out in the galaxy to make sure that they, they stayed the number one civilization? Mm -hmm. Detect anything, it gets destroyed. And that was the background to hired guns. We got as far as, you know, okay, uh, planning out hired guns too, but then it broke even. Didn't make a profit, and Scott left uh, to join Microprose. So you know that kind of faltered. But yeah, I would I would love to write all that up as a novel one day. You know, once I've got you know the current stuff out of the way. 
I mentioned the not entirely great relationship with Psygnosis, but the example that hit me the hardest was, like I said, I typeset to manual and we've got, you know, the various uh, printouts of it, but he was doing that on an Amiga. Psygnosis decided, yeah, possibly not fairly, that it needed to be done on a Mac. Okay, no, that's fair enough. But then they were going to send it to a third party to actually do the typesetting. And then 11 months go by. <laughs> 11 months go past. Then this manual is typeset. So the first I see of the manual is when they sent up a complimentary copy. You know, so I opened, opened the box. Oh, my first published work. And, you know, and, uh, oh, oh, oh. I was looking at the story and the, 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 there's no punctuation. Uh, no quote marks, there's no comments, there's no... Fuel stops. It's like what? What? What happened? What went through the whole thing? And it's like that. Oh, this is ruined. This is absolutely ruined. So it's like notice claim that it was a problem with fonts. You know, their third party doing this, and I believe that it was fixed in a subsequent version. But this is horrible, horrible stuff. So you know, we've got this explanation of why it happened, and. Yeah, I wonder if a first edition hired guns with those mistakes included holds uh, more mm. value. <laughs> mm. Yes, yes, hype that up a little bit and then put it on eBay. Yeah. I think my own <laughs> copy is a bit beat up for that, but that's yes, I thought. It sounds like it would have been a good port for the Atari Jaguar, yeah, doesn't it? He wanted to sell guns. <laughs> oh, <ouch. laughs> <laughs> Trying to escape is a theme in your music choices, which has cropped up a few times now. Were you settled at DMA or was escape on your mind? I think that's fair. Um, yeah, I, I'm quite surprised, you know, reading back some of my old diary entries. There, there were times that I hated it there. I, d I don't know why. I mean, I, c I can't recall feeling that bad, but I think really... Once I started doing writing, I, I wanted to write to novels. Games were great, but as as time went on, it became quite apparent that a, a story for a game was not a high priority. So you know, it became it became unsatisfying, really. I mean, you know, I'm talking about 1996, 97 around here, but you know, I went in waves, and a game would be released and. It was a success, and I was like, oh, I had a part of that, and oh, this was great. And But I kind of think I fell into DMA by default, really. Um, it was fun. I was with my friends. There, there wasn't an alternative out there for, for paid work that I could credibly think of doing. Yeah. Uh, I have been debating with myself, you know, whether I'd bring this up, but yeah... Uh, I have suffered from depression, you know, just my whole life. And there was something about some of those days that could be really bad for that. You know, the open plan office, you know, all, all the, the wee noises, uh, music being played. And, you know, so, uh, you know, I wrote at home. But, you know, the good times are great. You know, they, they really were good. It seems to be actually quite, quite common among... Um people who work in the software industry, and certainly among gamers, I'm noticing. Oh, what I'll say about depression is it's insidious in that one of the things it can do is make you want to not seek help for it. You know, I, I ended up rationalising it the way as, you know, the artistic temperament, you know, I was just a bit grumpy, all that sort of thing, and it only... It was only laterally, you know, towards the present day that I really figured out what was happening you know if i could travel back in time to my early 20s you know that would be one of the things i would say here's what's happening to you it's okay well uh wow. there is an exclusive uh, that's the first time i've ever i've ever spoken about that in public well i i i i hope it feels cathartic a little bit you know um it does it does uh, when it when it became obvious you know what was happening um you know, I see that, you know, I was into, you know, the UFOs and the flying saucers and everything because it was something special, something, you know, there's a thing, you know, secret knowledge, you know, secret power, which is, I think secret, you know, the secret power is a hacker thing as well. You know somebody, uh, sorry, you know something that nobody else knows. 
it makes you special. So this was the, the feelings of being alone, being isolated, and that is a lot of what fed into Fire Guns, you know, that this whole world being isolated and alone. And, you know, I think I was exploring some of my darker moods, you know, through Fire Guns, which is it's just as well that, you know, nobody was checking up on that. My next choice is Uniracers, also known as Uni Rally, uh, music by Colin Anderson. Now, this was a DMA game where you race unicycles. Unusual, very unusual, but hey, that's, that's DMA's thing, doing strange things. It's 1994, and this was a Super Nintendo exclusive title. Why has DMA suddenly made a Super Nintendo game? I can't say with absolute certainty. I think it really came down to Dave Jones going to a trade show. It was either one of the CESs or E3 and bumping into Nintendo. We made uh, a demo, burnt into a SNES cartridge, which played back a clip from Star Wars full motion video, which apparently Nintendo thought wasn't possible. We thought it was possible. We made it happen. Nintendo were like, wow, this is amazing, and we should work together. That's that's how we think it happened. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Mike will listen to this and go, no, 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 no. Here's what happened. <laughs> Again, it was a, a, a writing sort of a deal to typeset the manual and write it. And there wasn't that much of a brief. Uh, again, I, I almost had a free reign to create the manual as I saw fit. And I think it's my best work to come out of DMA. I wrote this absolutely ludicrous, sarcastic, hopefully humorous tract that explained how, how the game was played, how the background of an intelligent world of unicycles came about, you know, all, all this all this silly stuff, you know. Knowing Nintendo gave no credit to anybody. You know, DMA's logo was about an eighth of an inch tall in the back of the box. That was it. That was it. So I knew that, well, I had to do something. So I did that daft thing, you know, this page intentionally left blank. And then filled it in with some doodles. You know, unicycles, us v them, stick figures of unicycles and people and daft things, you know, the theory of unirases and, you know, a black hole and some equations in my handwriting so that I could go, well, what? Me. Definitely me. So, so unirases sold pretty well, shifting 300,000 copies until... I know, I know what's coming. DMA was sued for the use of the unicycle in the game. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that was a fun week. Um... <laughs> Yeah, 300,000 and then off the shelves. It, I think th- it is quite murky, really. The Whether it was legal or not, you know, how far you can go in copying an existing property you know, before it's passing off rather than uh, fair use. Dave was inspired by Pixar, you know, quite, quite clearly. You know, the, the short movie about, you know, a unicycle. So, you know, Dave, he can, oh, there's a game in that, there's a game in this. And at some point, he must have thought to himself, yeah, there's a game racing unicycles. Now, so far, that would be fine, man. that would be fine. Um, he had me write up a two-page, no, not proposal exactly, but, you know, a document and with the, the provisional title, you know, it's the temporary one of Red Racer. So, you know, Red's Dream, Red Racer, you can yeah, maybe see where the inspiration was. But, you know, within a few days, uh, that had become uh, One by One, which is a title I actually prefer over Uniracers. 
we had uh, a short-lived project in development, a, race, a car racing game called 4 by 4 So with DMA humour, a unicycle became 1x1. One one. Word came through, Pixar are seeing this. Our office manager, uh, Stuart Dell, you know, put out the word, OK, we need to find some prior art. You know, I looked through my box of old games and you know, PC fuzz, a policeman riding a unicycle, but, you know, that wasn't quite right. Uh, Mike found something else. Um, and I was... Absolutely, oh, 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 I can head this off because what they were objecting to, not was the use of unicycles, but of the use of a unicycle as a character. Okay, and I remembered back, way back at the, 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 the KACC, you know, the Kingsway Computer Club, you know, those other gra- graphics. I had, and I've still got graph paper where I drew a unicycle. I cannot for the life of me remember what it was for, but it was something that, you know, we were going to be doing, you know, back in 1984, 1985, whenever it was, a unicycle. You know, grabbed it out and it's like ah but I've got a person riding it you know so that wasn't any <laughs> use either so I, I do remember seeing a video that the the prosecution had sent over uh basically a side by side comparison you know they're you know red uh, from red's dream um taking a bow you know something sort of, you know, pushing forward coming back and one of the uniracers doing the same motion, you know, going forward, coming back, sort of thing, and yeah, that looks almost identical. They'd had to slow down our unicycle by uh, at least half in order to make it match. Well, was it fair for us to do that? I, I can't say. I really can't say. It was a unicycle, but the rest of it was completely our own invention. Uh, it, it was fun seeing behind the scenes, you know, if you, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Steve, would you like to introduce your ultimate track? It's stepping back a bit, but also moving forward a bit. It's Life Force, Condor 64 track, Rob Hubbard, you know, all was good, but it's a remix from the early 2000s, Life Force 2000 by Alistair Brimble, because I think it's a, it's a track that stays with me. You know, it's, it's an all-time classic, I think. There are many remixes of it. This is the, the subculture again, um, a kind of validation, really, you know, you know, us back then with our games were a real genuine bit of culture because now people are going back and being inspired by that culture and making new things from it. Music remixes. Steve, you left DMA Design in 1997. What were your reasons for moving on? From about uh, 1996 onwards, I was going back into one of those periods where things were becoming a bit unsatisfying. At that time, I was working with Body Harvest, which was you know, the, the golden child of, uh, of all of DMA's projects at the time. Now, this was uh, a Nintendo game for the Ultra 60... <laughs> Nintendo 64, but it'll always be... Ultra 64 to me, you know, with the possibility of becoming a launch title. So, again, I wrote story, background and stuff for that. Now, Body Harvest is, was a 1950s B-movie, but it's a modern game taking place in the modern age 
during the 1950s worldwide revival. You know, that's how it started. Um, it was intended to have the feel of, I don't know if you remember the film Tremors, which was a B-movie, but yeah. a really nicely done one. You know, that sort of feel. It was aliens are eating us for food, but a bit light-hearted. So, you know, I, I wrote material like that. Uh, for one of the, the trade shows, I had to come up with a, a tagline. And, you know, I think it's the best thing I've ever written. They came to meet us, greet us, and eat us. Oh, you know, genius. I never got used, never got used. So, uh-huh. the, the character who was unnamed at this time, um, he became Adam, Adam Drake. You know, you know there's an 80s you know, movie hero. He was intended to be an all-American action hero, originally. He then became a World War One soldier, briefly. Uh, then Nintendo of Japan wanted him to wear a tuxedo and be a secret agent, which meant they needed to be a secret society, which uh, Brian Ulrich from Nintendo of America, you know, had ideas about that, you know, so it became, you know, the Order of St. George for hundreds of, or hundreds of years protecting us against the dragons, which were the aliens and, yeah. uh, and all this. Um, and then it became a time travel story. And this is absolutely the most incredible moment that I've ever had, you know, the the faxes going back and forward between me. Uh, now, I think it was Dan Olsen, Nintendo of America, and Hiro Yamada, Nintendo of Japan. Uh, and in the same week, uh, Nintendo of America saying, yeah, could you make it a bit more complex? And Nintendo of Japan saying, could you simplify it a bit? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so I went through to Stuart, you know, the office manager, and how, how do I sort this? He said, and I quote, suck up to the Japanese. Okay. Simplify it. So yeah, things got less satisfying, you know, after then. So to get back to the question, why did I leave? There was a change of guard at DMA. Our publisher was Psygnosis. We'd got ties with them. We were expanding into America. We had an office in Boulder, DMA US. And then Gremlin Graphics uh, bought to DMA. And none of us knew that this was being planned in the background, you know, we, we all, all got taken to you know, a conference room and, you know, told about what was happening and this is all going on. Now, a few months prior to that, I had the chance to remake Hired Guns with the Unreal Engine, with DMA US. And this was an earlier sort of merger acquisition. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name, but anyway, it brought Unreal technology you know, within DMA's reach. So, hey, make our guns. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to do that. So, I expanded the background, you know, came up with a design document, you know, a rough design document, to be fair, and, you know, did all this this work for, a, you know, a, a reboot. Then DMA was bought by Gremlin Graphics, and suddenly, well, you know, the DMA US doing Higher Guns, the remake, was with Psygnosis. We can't be owned by one publisher and have games for another. Okay? So... The only way around that was, well, DMA US is going to become its own spin-off company. Right. So, well, either to give that up, stay at DMA and work on well, whatever was coming up the road, which which would have been Realms of the Haunting 2. Not a bad thing, you know, doing the story for that, but to to do had guns, had guns, you know, that's my thing. To do that, I had to go freelance. You know, that, that was the choice I had. So, you know, deliberated, went freelance. Not a good idea, as it turned out, because, you know, after another three months, you know, they turned around and went, mm, yeah, we're, we're not using third parties anymore. Bye. <laughs> and that was it. You know, that was, you know, there, there was a, a couple of minor things after that, but by the start of 98, uh, I was basically out of the games industry. 1997, though, was the same year DMA released the first Grand Theft Auto. So it must have been in development whilst you were still there. Did you get to see much of the production? Yeah, Grand Theft Auto was just another project. It was it wasn't even a big deal. It wasn't a big project. It started at the beginning of nineteen ninety five, where okay, we were doing you know all these Nintendo things, but you know Nintendo needs a license you know to develop for their platform, so that costs money and. Well, you know, specialised development kit. Dave was exploring the possibility, we'll just use PCs. Don't need to pay anyone a licence to develop for that. Got a meeting together, hey, we need ideas. And, okay, uh, car racing game, you know, was one of them. But I wasn't part of the team. 
I mean, this was the thing. I wasn't part of the body harvest team. I wasn't part of the Grand Theft Auto team. I was part of the design department where ideas came through the design department. We would look at them. We would come up with ideas and, you know, evaluate them and do a lot of the other work, you know, like obviously manuals and stuff like that. And, and nobody liked us <laughs> because because of it, you know, our, our interference. But, but, you know, we threw around some ideas for a game. Um, there was a guy called Alec, and I can't remember his surname, but, you know, he was he was one of the the world's gentle souls. Right? So we, we were tossing around ideas, and he out loud wondered, you know, why do games have to be violent, you know, ahead of his time, as usual. So, you know, we were in the design department talking about, uh, you know, racing cars and what sort of cars and what y- you could do. And it wasn't a big deal, because I can barely remember what was said. You know, it was just yeah, another project, you know, coming along. But I do I do remember Alex said something absolutely amazing, you know. What have your racing concepts? And um what what concepts about racing? No, no, no. Racing concepts, racing metaphysical concepts against each other. Whoa. Wow. So needless to say, that never really went any further, but could you imagine what GTA might have been like if that had taken hold? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the, you know the world's first metaphysical car racing game. So yeah, um, you know, so so we we did uh, a few ideas around it, and that was mainly it. You know, when you first joined DMA, did you ever think there'd be such thing as a design department within the company? How did the culture compare to those earlier days? There seems to have been a few changes in culture. You know, at the very beginning, a few friends, you know, just having a laugh, making games. You know, a, a hobby that you're getting paid for. I mean, that that was that was great. Uh, by the time we got to 30 people, we'd moved premises. Up, um, this was up to Discovery House in the technology park, you know, proper grown-up things like renting out uh, office space and, you know, getting in desks, all that kind of thing. So we had about 30 people, and that's about the point that it starts to divide into cliques. Not overt at first, but if you're in a different room, it, it almost becomes inevitable. Um, by the time of GTA, we had 150 people, and that's when the culture really started to diverge. You know, we had grievances, you know, happening. I think you no, know, the design department for me was a great place you know, to work, um, but not everybody thought it was such a good place at the time. I think I can't confirm it yet, but I think there there were a dozen members of the Body Harvest team threatened to quit at one time. Just because all of the changes that were being imposed, you know, the, the the famous one where Nintendo said make the graphics more material, and nobody knew what that meant. So you made the decision to leave DMA. What did you go on to do, um, and what are you doing now, Steve? I thought, well, you know, I need to get a job. I need to get a job, but you know, you can't be too too picky. So, you know, went to a recruitment agency, and I got a job at uh, W. L. Gore, which had the factory in Dundee. Uh, I I didn't really know much of what they did, you know, Gore-Tex, you know, that was the main thing. But, you know, I went along, got a job on the uh, production line, you know, making making products. So, you know, that was fine. You know, it's about as stable a job as I could get. I ended up basically doing an engineering support role, writing software to control the test equipment. You know, among, amongst a few other things, but that was me for the next 15 years. <laughs> and Hired Guns lives in spirit as well. I was contacted by uh, G-Void Games last year, or was it a year before, but anyway, uh, a game called Inviolate, you know, using modern technology, which is a retro feel to it. It's a dungeon crawler with a science fiction theme, and they asked me to write the, write the story. A cyberpunk game, and I thought, delightful. I would love to do that. So, you know, I've written some stuff. I think they are trying to finish off the uh, you know, the demo at the moment, but it's got a hair guns feel to it, but a different story. So yeah, um, I'm being kept busy. I'm being kept busy. Steve, you now have two important decisions to make before we leave you on Retro Island. You can pick only one of the eight tracks you've shared with us today to keep you company. Which will it be? That is surprisingly difficult. It would be... Yeah, it has to be... It has to be Head Guns. Falling into the sky, as I named it. The victory theme. It's an escape. Well, escape at last. Life is open. And you can also pick one game or application to enjoy on Retro Island, the only condition being that it has no internet connectivity. 
What will you take with you? Oh, I thought about this. Uh, my first reaction was Scrivener, which is, you know, uh, a bit of writing software. Uh, it's wonderful. But, but, I am going to say Emacs. The programmer's text editor, which I can also do writing with. No, seriously, no, I'm sorry, Vim guys, but, you know, <laughs> Emacs, oh man, it's just endlessly configurable. It's old school, it, it speaks to something technical within me. So yeah, I was have fun with that on this island. Emacs and headguns, yeah. Andrew, yeah. why are you shaking your head? <laughs> You're welcome to have it. <laughs> You're welcome to have Emacs. Emacs and Vim, both for you camps and nutters. You should be using Nano. <laughs> You've made your choices, Steve, and we hope they serve you well to keep you sane on Retro Island, writing your Emacs macros in Lisp. Thank you so much for sharing your fascinating career with us today. Oh, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Steve. And if you enjoyed the show today, why not take a moment to check out our other podcast episodes, or you can find more retro goodness on my YouTube channel, Retro Man Cave. And you can find me on the YouTube channel, Back Office Show, to which you'll find links in the show notes as well as links to Steve's choices. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye.